Okay, so our last session for today become, welcomes a panel of investors in the RAS space to talk and share ideas about um, their outlook into the direction of the industry and maybe talk about their own interests, their own investment interests as well. So um, for our last panel, I'd like to welcome Roy Hoyas, who is the owner and CEO of Lighthouse Finance. We also have Jamie Steen, who is the director at Font Capital and co-founder of Devonian Capital, and Eric Tavetoras, investment director at New Frontiers, Nutrico's investment arm. Welcome, everyone. Hi, Jean. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Hi there. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you for being here. Um, Eric, I'm just going to wait for your camera to turn on there. OK, perfect. We see you perfectly. <laughs> Let's start with some introductions, shall we? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your organization and perhaps some insight into the investment interests that you're currently representing? So maybe I'll start with Roy and an introduction on Lighthouse. Thank you, Jane. And thank you for <clears throat> inviting me to the session and be on the panel with Jamie and Eric. Um, that's uh, always uh, enjoyable. Uh, Lighthouse Finance is... is uh, the company started back uh, several years ago in, in Norway. Uh, based on that, we were working with uh, the salmon industry and providing financing for their CapEx program. Uh, we learned a lot of that. It was an early stage back in 2007. Um, but we decided that we wanted to go 100% into the seafood industry on a global um, strategy to support um, the seafood industry with uh, our knowledge and, and solutions to provide good financial solution for their CapEx investments. And uh, since then we have been developing the company and have clients all over the world. And uh, obviously the ROS has been uh, a technology that we know quite well from the smolt and, and later the big smolt uh, development in, in the salmon industry. And um, we, we saw uh, the potential of this uh, opening a new market and possibilities to grow fish all the places than just in the sea or in special areas. And um, we tested that out with the first grow out uh, case we were involved with was back in 2009, where we were able to put together a financing package for a company. And uh, since then we have been focusing and uh, working very close with uh, the producer of technology and solutions, and obviously been involved in a lot of cases over the years. Jamie, I'll go to you next and um, tell us a little bit about Devonian Capital. Yeah, thank you, Jean, and thanks uh, for the invitation as well. Um, so we set up Devonian Capital in 2017, the idea being to catalyze new investment into land-based aquaculture, of course, not realizing that a whole ton of capital was about to flood into the sector at that time. Um, but what we, what we wanted to do was to identify early stage businesses that were trying to uh, get a commercial proof of concept. So something that's somewhere between 50 tons and a couple of hundred tons that was going to not only demonstrate technical and operational KPIs, but also commercial KPIs, invest in those businesses, and then work with them to help them get further capital and to be able to get to the point where further investment uh, was going to be able to come into them. Um, so over that time, we've invested in a few different businesses, uh, and then we've worked uh, very, very closely with those businesses uh, and uh, pretty excited about how they're going across a range of different species. Now, Eric, Tavetoros, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> I studied. So um, can you tell us a little bit about um, your <clears throat> role in New Frontiers and Nutrico? Sure, sure. It's a, it's a difficult surname, uh, but, but good effort. Um, <laughs> I'm, um, yeah, so uh, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm part of uh, New Frontiers, which is the, uh, the corporate venture arm of, of Nutrico. Uh, we were set up in 2017 with a remit to invest in um, startups or scale-ups that had a, a strategic interest to our core business. Um, so initially we focused uh, only on uh, um, uh, fish health, uh, fish nutrition and uh, precision farming within the aquaculture space. Uh, and then we expanded that 
or scope uh, in 2019 into alternative farming technologies, um, of which uh, obviously RAS is, is one such alternative uh, mode of farming, if you will. Um, and we also, uh, but we're actually technology agnostic. So we, we also have an interest in, in, um, in offshore farming um as a as a new novel way of farming and closed um containment sea systems uh but unfortunately in those other um farming approaches the regulatory landscape has just been too difficult so we've been we've been most active uh within ras uh and we've, we've made uh, uh six direct investments and one fund uh, indirect fund investment uh so far Roy, I'll go back to you with this question. Um, what makes RAS an attractive industry, do you think, to invest in? Well, the way we look at it is that the technology itself is nothing new. It's the knowledge and, and experience that has been growing and, and getting better and better. Uh, for us, it's all about the main purpose of what Lighthouse was set out to do it was to support the growth of the seafood industry in general, but also specified on, on growing farming and volume and not only salmon, but all species. And, uh, and we, we, we really believe that Ross is, is one of the cornerstone technology ways to go forward to increase the volume of um, healthy food to the growing population, actually. Um, for you, Jamie, um, when Devonian Capital started, was it the same uh, quality that attracted you and Devonian Capital to the industry? And does it remain the same today? So we we felt that we, we we sort of looked at the slides that everyone's seen on this call about there's no more fish coming out of the sea and the growth of aquaculture uh, globally. And we thought there is an opportunity for RAS to be potentially at some point as big as conventional aquaculture, because there are limits to how much conventional aquaculture you can do. There are biological limits to that. And we see that in different, in different countries. You look at what happens to the, the price of licenses and you look at the cost of RAS coming down. And at a certain point, RAS has the capability to explode. Uh, if, 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 if it can move away from being what I think it still is now, which is a bit of a black box approach and get to the point where people and investors really understand what's going on with it, then that will bring the cost of capital down and that will bring the weight of capital up. And that will mean that more, more projects and more projects can be financed. So that was what got us excited about it. I don't think that's changed. We've certainly found that things have tended to take longer than we might have hoped with all of the different projects that we've worked on. There's there's always some unexpected things. Um, but I certainly believe that when projects are able to show real operational KPIs and able to show real prices for what they're achieving and real costs for what it's costing them to uh, to, to produce, then I think there'll be a, a lot of weight of money that's available to support those companies. Um, so we're still very excited about it. We still think the opportunity is huge. And we still think, and we are early stage investors in this area, we still think that's the most interesting time to invest because first of all, it's where the companies most need the capital. Um, and, and that's always a nice discussion to have with the, with, with the entrepreneurs. Um, but it's also the time where you can get the most upside if the project is able to deliver. So we're, we're, we're still pretty excited about, uh, about all, the, all the factors that we, we, we saw at the beginning. Um, and we're certainly enjoying working with the teams that we're working with. Um, Eric, you wanted to talk a little bit about how the um, RAS investment opportunities can change at this stage, because I, I mean, a few years ago, it very much felt like a RAS, um, the capital raising felt, felt like a RAS gold rush in a way. So what will it take to kind of make RAS investment opportunities institutional grade from here? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so you're right. And I, I think the, the capital markets um, route for new entrants is um, uh, is not that feasible 
uh, anymore at this point in time. Might open up again when when the uh, macro picture looks a bit uh, clearer and rosier. But I think it's uh, it's probably not a compelling route for new players now. I think for established operators, that's still a a viable avenue. Um, so I'm really personally and and also uh, you know through our venture unit really looking hard at what what can we actually do to make ras more compelling to um to large infrastructure funds or um uh, specialized p funds um that have deeper pockets but are not willing to step into the space um because they um, uh, lack of um understanding or they they they, they don't appreciate the bio biological risk etc so um how to get to that point i think i think it's uh it's it's just seeing operators such as um such as carlo Einstein and, and lang sapphire uh just just growing biomass becoming more successful day by day uh you got kingfish in europe uh doing the same wanting to expand to uh to the us soon um so i don't think it's an overnight thing it's a it's a slow slow burn but uh, slowly but surely I'll, you'll you'll start to see uh, proof of concept at scale being demonstrated um and hopefully that will that will also generate uh, interest amongst investors with deeper pockets um Roy and Jamie I'll ask you as well in terms of uh maybe Roy first uh how um how much the investment environment has changed within the RAS industry in the past couple of years have you seen a big shift or do you feel like it's pretty much stay the same well I, I would definitely say it's been a big shift um uh, i think there were mentioned a gold rush some years back where more or less uh, a good powerpoint presentation was uh, was good enough to attract the money uh, in, a, in a blunt way to put it but it's changed it's changed a lot and um i see uh, we work closely with with sometimes with Jamie also to, to, to support the cases. But what we see is that you can't just come with a RAS solution or a business plan on RAS anymore. You need to, to really have a much broader um, understanding uh, and you need also to, to cover a much more ground than just putting up a technology and forming a species. And the picture is changed and uh, I think that the, the the landscape of capital is also changed a lot because you need patient money to to go into this industry, and that has been clearer uh, over the past few years. Um, and and that that is obviously um, narrowed down the the capacity and the opportunities for for new cases in the short run. What about you, Jamie? Do you have something to add about how it's changed in the past few years? I, I think it's remained hard, um, certainly at the early stage, to get people before you can really show that you're growing fish. I think investors are rightly cautious about whether whether a business plan can be fulfilled. So we then work really closely with the companies that we're invested in and try and help them tell their story, both to investors that we can introduce and investors that they know themselves, because often the company's got their own network of investors as well. And perhaps by, by working with them, we can help their investors get more comfortable. But at that early stage, before you're really producing to your KPIs, it's it's a hustle. You're, you know, you're really fighting hard to, uh, to get the capital and get the support um, that, that you're looking for. And then at a certain point, when things are starting to, to work a bit better, then you can, with those projects, you can go and, and, and we do, and go and discuss with, uh, with, with Eric or discuss them with Roy and, and you know, with partners who, who've got a greater weight of capital behind them. But you know that they're going to need to see things actually working to a certain extent. Um, so we're, we're sort of trying to support people in that, in that kind of early stage um and uh it, yes it's 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 always hard so what are you looking for when looking for new partners and new companies to um support um are there certain qualities or criteria in you know beyond their powerpoint presentation that 
um, you're looking for that check those boxes? Uh, Jamie, maybe I'll start with you first. Yeah, sure. Um, so we, we sort of look for, for three things when we're, we're assessing a, a company. We're, we're looking to understand the market for the product that they're trying to produce. So you're wanting to see, is there a, a good depth of market at a, at a price point that makes sense? Um, so we've invested in a company called Local Coho in upstate New York, and there's something really nice about the Coho salmon in that part of America because it gets a price premium over the Atlantic salmon. So right away, you've got a nice little premium uh, that, that helps you with, with your economics. So we look at the market very carefully. Um, we look at the team. Um, we, we try and look at not only the management team, but also the other investors, the board members who are sitting sitting behind that team. Uh, and, and, and also you're looking at the technology and you know, what was the process for selecting the technology? Is it a technology that's worked before? Has it has it been proven? Can you go and visit a farm that's that's using that technology designed by that same person? Um, when you're investing at the early stage, I, I don't think you ever get all of those things absolutely perfect. And, and so you've then got a choice. You can either walk away and say, guys, we're not interested, or you can get in and you can start working with the company and, and helping them. And, and so that's that's what we try and do. So it's definitely about the market, uh, it's about the technology, uh, and it's about the team. Um, Roy, for you, um, are there questions that um, new partners need to answer for you um, in their proposals? Or are there like common misconceptions that um, kind of trigger to you that they're not the right partner for you and for Lighthouse? Yeah, definitely. The, there are, and, and, and uh, I think Jamie covers three very important topics. Um, um, what, what we have also been focusing a lot on is uh, adding more to the technology side. Um, we don't like cases where the technology supplier can leave his solution after delivering. We would like to see that the raw supplier stands by his client and digs uh, has dirt on the finger when on his hands when, if nothing if something goes wrong. So we, we look for that type of close relationship. And and, and this, the other part I will add to what has been said is we re, uh, with the people side. We really would like to see a bigger understanding and a bigger business understanding of the model of the circular model, um, meaning that it's not good enough just to put up the farm of the species and everything. You, you need to show us that you understand the whole picture. And uh, that means from the genetic eggs to the end and, and ESG concept of how are you handling everything? Are you going to do it by yourself or? Do you have partners? So we we advise our cases where we are involved, where we're saying, um, don't think that you can be best at everything. Try to find partners that want to join you <clears throat> in different models. Uh, securing your offtake um, is an important part. Uh, but you know, if you find a partner that can take the processing part and the offtake part, you have a stronger case. So that angle is, is a part of how we approach our clients and the discussion we have with the different, um, different um, companies that we are uh, talking to. Eric, for you, um, what makes new partners um, attractive and stand out for what will be in the interests of New Frontiers and Nutrico? Um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe... If Three things I'd like to highlight. So we um, we, we differ slightly from from uh, uh, Jamie and Devonian in, in that um, you know in our in our origins as a feed company we uh, we know how to make feed but we, we we don't have the faintest clue about selling a fish to put it bluntly. So we've um, we made a, a conscious uh, decision to um, uh, that we uh, uh, we don't like uh, uh, market risk and, and branding risk, which means that we focus on uh, commoditized species, uh, so salmon, um, uh, and uh, to a lesser extent, uh, shrimp, which is also an industry we're we're big in. Um, that's not to say that we 
might look not look at other species in the future but that's um that's um our uh, our current focus um uh second thing is we uh we we do really want to see that there's been a substantial development already gone into a project and what i mean by that is that um uh, we we don't particularly like uh, uh, construction risk, so we we like projects where uh, the detailed design engineering is complete or nearly complete. Um, and we, we we spend a lot of time trying to understand what the the contract structure uh, is around that, and which partners are involved on the civil side, and uh, of course the RAS technical side and other sub suppliers, and what contract wrapper is is. Uh, uh, managing all that um, and the third part is and here I think um, the, the three of us agree is is uh, the people themselves um, we we do look for a, a good mix of um, uh, complementary capabilities uh, we, we want to see strong financial skills we we want um, uh, them to have an uh, industry link from beforehand uh, but of course, we have a strong bias and preference for strong technical RAS operational skills uh, from beforehand, uh, either through other projects or, or background or, or the people involved having uh, some uh, actual hands on background from from running RAS farms. I think maybe just just to add to that, if I may, um, you know, I mentioned market team and, and technology. I think there's a really interesting piece around the interaction between the team and the technology provider. Um, so again, another company that we've we invested in is is Aquaco, um, Joe's Joe's project. I'm looking at his face right in the middle of my screen at the moment. So give a little shout out there. Um, but they've got Dan Farkas, who obviously very, very experienced uh, RAS professional, but some someone on the on the company side of the table interfacing with the engineering side you, you don't want these things to be fully led by the engineering company there's a there's a lot of engineering talent out there but you've got to be able to have some helpful tension between the operator and the engineering company you've got to you've got to have someone on the farming side who's really focused on how's this thing actually going to work to run it not just to to, to build it um so i think that's another piece that's you know May, maybe differentiate some of the companies that we're um, we're looking to work with. Mm -hmm. um, shifting perspective a little bit, um, in terms of the investment community and what you've seen, what do what have you seen is the most commonly mis misunderstanding about the RAS industry um, for someone who's just coming into the investment community? Jamie, what do you think? That it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think I think maybe that that misconception uh, is mm. is is perhaps changing. Um, I, I think yeah, you know, people do understand that it that it's difficult and that um, you know not, not not every company makes mistakes, but you know mistakes are part of life, and a lot of companies will at some point. And so it's good to kind of build things incrementally and kind of learn as you go and make sure you've got the right brains, trust, and expertise around your organization. Um, it's I, I, probably the biggest misconception that, that is, is that, um, is that it's going to do what the spreadsheet says, and actually it's going to do what the fish do, and it's going to do what the microbes in the biofilter do. And it's just an awful lot better to remember that and get people involved who've got real hands-on experience of that stuff. Roy, what do you think? Um, common misconceptions for people entering the investment, the RAS investment space? Well, the question would be much easier to answer to one year ago, but uh, today I think the learning curve has been <laughs> quite good at, at the, the most of the market. Uh, and, and rightfully, uh, that, that, that is um, very good actually. Um, but as Jamie points out, the spreadsheet is the devil here, and um, you, you can't actually use that uh, to anything. Um, and and again, um, it's also uh, what I said: patient money. Um, people think they can get their 
payback of three years, four years, five years. Uh, that's where they have a wake up call, uh, most of them. And, and that is changing also very fast um, as the industry is growing. And it is, it's a very young industry and there are uh, a lot to learn and experience to gain and knowledge to build. And um, that covers also for the financing part of the, uh, the, the, the industry itself. So um, it's changing every day to the better. And uh, um, I think uh, I think that um, we see less, less of this type of uh, misunderstanding now than we did just 12 months ago, actually. Um, what about you, Eric? Um, do you still see a lot of impatience in the investor community? Uh, yes, I was going to make an an excel joke but the the gentleman beat me <laughs> to it um uh, no I, I agree with with um with jamie and roy here and um perhaps one thing to add is um mm. um there's uh, there's a huge huge push uh, uh also for other aspects to these investment cases for example the the use of um novel ingredients um the added complexity of of uh sludge handling and how that's um could uh interface into a fertilizer use or energy production and um those bits are just compounding complexity on on top of an already complex thing which is to 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 uh run an entire system uh filled with the uh, fish uh, with uh, individual biological systems so, um, so that's perhaps an area where I still uh, feel there's a great need for um, uh, being careful and uh, not moving too fast in uh, uh, implementing uh, a new type of ingredient, for example, in a RAS system. It needs to be tested out um, thoroughly and deliberately to make sure there's no, um, no bad impact on the system uh, or the fish or, or, or the growth. Mm -hmm. And coming back to, um, you know, our keynote presentation with Atlantic Sapphire earlier today, um, a lot of, I guess, commenters in the industry kind of point to, you know, their series of events and their, you know, which led to a plunge in their share prices. Um, they've pointed to that as um, sort of an example of how investors have become more shy about the industry as a whole. Um, have you seen the same thing in your networks? Um, has that been a big driver to um, the pulling back or, of capital? Um, Roy, maybe I'll ask you first. Well, I think the good thing with the uh, big software is, is, is that they, they are um, driving the knowledge uh, and understanding better and better in the market generally. And from our side, I mean, the capital structure we have to support our cases, they, they have been understanding this and, and um, we, you can say that there are, a, there are a penalty of being listed uh, also. It's a good thing for the raising of the capital, but you get very hard, um, hard, hard hit uh, if, if, if you don't follow your plans and, and your forecast. And, and that's, that's obviously a challenge for, for those companies. Uh, because again, it's the nature of farming and biology. It's nothing you can do than just trying to do things better every day. And, and there will be setbacks um, of the complexity of getting everything uh, working to the maximum uh, excellent level. But um, I think from our side, we, we, we see that our capital partners are confident and they understand it takes time. Um, what we usually provide in is, is a 10 year view of the, the money and that we support in the, uh, in the cases. And uh, if there are short money, we, we don't think they are the right capital profile to support this industry at the moment, actually. Um, Jamie, uh, for you, is 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 stock market performance a good um, indicator of a company's overall health or like potential projection? Um, 
Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I, 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 I like the point that Roy made about the, the public markets being somewhere where, you know, you, you're a lot more exposed. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, I think there is enormous potential for RAS in the public markets, absolutely enormous potential, but I'm not sure that it's going to happen really for a few years. And I think what's going to be needed is some companies producing a decent volume of of fish and making something that looks like a profit doing it and at that point i think the public markets and the bond markets will be an amazing way of of helping the industry to grow but but that has to be from a solid base and it has to be uh it, it has to be based on helping those investors understand what's really going on under the tent so no 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 black Black, black box approach um is the market an indicator of a company's performance sometimes i think is probably the most honest answer sometimes the market gets it right sometimes the market gets it wrong it's um it's it's hard to say i mean it's you know if, if you have bad events and difficulties and, and things go slower um and you've told investors about a very ambitious plan investors will mark the stock down on the other hand if you're able to bring them some good news and show that you're doing what you said you were going to do, then they'll have they'll have confidence. So there's going to be a correlation, um, but the markets don't always get it right either. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many people um, having fun in the financial markets. Um, Eric, would you? Um, is there anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, um, I mean there there's inherent things in RAS companies scaling, which is not um, too compatible in the short term with rising share prices. Like some of the companies are not fully financed for their build out. Um, the investor market knows this, so that's an, uh, will automatically de depress share prices because they know, they know there will be an equity race at some point. Um, I think there's been a, an unfair correlation um, with um, 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 some of the unfortunate events uh, in the past at Atlantic Sapphire with with other companies that uh, um, have uh, had, had no you know no real correlation to those events, but they're they're perceived negatively by investors. But like Jamie said, I think that will that will change over time um, as we see more operator, operators come on stream and uh, existing ones. Uh, grow and successfully harvest um, the the capital um, markets way of growing that industry will uh, will come back. Um, what about fluctuating prices um, that we've seen in salmon, for example? Um, how has that impacted the industry, in your opinion? Um, maybe Eric, I'll go to you first. Um, yeah, I'm not actually sure. I, I saw that question before. I'm not actually sure I understand it. But so, I mean, yes, salmon prices in the short to medium term are can be volatile and seasonal. But the long run salmon prices um, are fundamentally uh, on an upwards trajectory and have been for the last five or six years because there's a there's a very strong fundamental imbalance. Uh, in in the supply growth globally versus the demand. Um, so long run, I, I don't think it should impact neg negatively on on the rice industry. Quite quite the contrary, uh, there's there's enough uh, demand for salmon in the world for uh, for for rice companies to carve out um, uh, their piece of the market. Roy or Jamie. Well, I agree with Eric. Um, coming from where we are today, you see a price per kilo of eight euros or something. Um, when I started working with the salmon farmers, they got 1.8 euro per kilo. So um, that was the price uh, back in the day. So uh, looking at this now, um, I don't see any, any possibility that that will have an impact for for the for, for the upcoming new cases 
Okay. And I, th I think er Eric's right to bring up supply and demand. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, there is more demand for seafood than there is supply, and that translates into rising prices. Where that kind of really translates into higher value is is actually interestingly to the license owner uh, uh so it doesn't you know it's the person who has the right to take certain fish out of the sea or the or the group that has the right to farm certain uh certain species in a certain area that's where the value accretion has as, as happens as supply and demand are on the trend that they're on and that's where as i said earlier the cost of a license starts to be not far off the cost of putting in a, a new RAS facility, um, which, which I think is, is, is kind of quite an interesting dynamic. The, there's something to bear in mind with the price volatility, though, which is that on the individual farm level, if you're close to the market, you're not necessarily having a, a kind of spot price relationship with your consumers. So if you're in a, if a farm in North America and you're producing a really high quality fish, and you're providing that to local distributors or to local retailers, you will you will want to have a relationship with them that gives them and you some level of, of visibility on what the price is, because otherwise they're going to have to be bouncing their price up and down with, with their customers. And you, you want to be a reliable partner to them, and they want to be a reliable partner to you. So I think there can be sometimes less volatility in the actual relationships between a local supplier and a local uh, and a local customer than it might appear from kind of what goes on in the in the spot market um but eric's right the, and and roy as well i mean the price the price has been going up there, there needs to be more supply um roy i'll <clears throat> excuse me i'll direct this question to you um you talked about ras being patient money so this question's Investors often seek a three to seven year exit. Is this feasible in aquaculture? Not three years, uh, I believe. Uh, well, no, I would say that if you look at this industry, um, despite the species you would like to start farming, uh, if it's shrimp, we, we work uh, Eric mentioned the shrimp industry that we think it's also a brilliant possibility for us development in the future and other species. Um, I don't think that that is possible. Um, I will say if, if, if you are looking on the numbers you put out, seven years, yes, maybe. Um, but still there, you need to have patient money and uh, yeah. To seven to ten years, then I think that's a better scope. Okay. Um, this this question men mentions Eric. Um, how do you see the role of investors versus project developers? Eric describes Nutripro as quite risk adverse, which requires project developers um, working for years prior to getting to the point where they have the RAS supplier, the civil contractors, permits, etc. How do you see yourself operating in this industry where it takes years of input before you break ground, then years of building, then years of growing before you can harvest. Um, so I guess, yeah, the, the main question is, how do you see your role throughout this process as an investor? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I can only speak for Nutreco, right? And, and it is correct that we have, uh, we are risk averse and have, uh, become a little bit more so um, the last uh, year, I would say. Uh, but uh, but there will be other investors who are more looking to take that early stage risk. So, you know, the the all the way from the, the gamut of friends and family, family offices, private investors. So um, um, we, 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 we don't necessarily need to see a project developer working completely on its uh, own and, and bootstrapping their operations. We, we we would like to see that there has been perhaps one or two or even three private rounds with early stage investors gone into a project before before we step in. Um, and then, uh, but then having said that, um, the venture arm, which, which I'm uh, part of, is only one part of the tracker, right? So, um, uh, scratching as a 
feed provider and having operated in, in the RAS space with products for, for many years uh, can take an earlier role in working with RAID projects um, from uh, engaging on um, uh, RAS feed diets, uh, technical services, um, you know, uh, advice on how to um, um, design the, the feed logistics solution. So, so there are, there are earlier engagement points for uh, Nutreco, but it will would be more driven from our uh, feed business. Jamie, for you and working with entrepreneurs at the early stage, um, how do you see your role as an investor and um, developing mm -hmm. the project with those partners? I, th I think our role is to to try and ch challenge the plan in in a helpful way and and try and work with them. I think that's one of the advantages that can come th with with investing early, is that you get the opportunity to to explore the plan with the entrepreneur before they've built their first uh, before they built their first facility. You get to explore how they're going to project manage it so there's a number of discussions that you can have and I, I yeah that that's the approach we try and take we try and be as helpful as we can across the areas where we can bring um bring something to bear whether that's on the actual ras operations um my partner andre or whether that's the development expertise that some of my other partners have or or, or more on the financing side which is where i tend to show up so um just try and be helpful um, we're coming up to our time here. So Roy, I want to ask you one last question. Um, in terms of the outlook for the industry in the next year, um, what are the challenges that you think the industry needs to address in the short term in the next year? Well, um, that was a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I know it is. Um, but is there <laughs> anything that you want to see in the industry in the next year for it to kind of um, progress and become more attractive, maybe for more capital. I, I think it's it's moving on what we are involved in in the cases we know and work with, and they are several. Uh, <clears throat> I think they are moving the right way. Um, I think it, you need to look at it from two different ways. Um, we are definitely doing that. We are looking at the one that are in some stage now that there are known cases. Um, they are more into doing the things right and learning and going fast as fast as possible up to an excellent level of producing. Then you need to look at the new cases coming up and there are some new cases on the table that we are looking at. What we see from them is that they, they need to show that they have been looking to learn from what has been done and they need to start where they are. They need also to start on that level when they're coming with the cases. It's been too many cases where we are going to. Uh, that doesn't work anymore. We need to see this is what we have done and this is the next step we are going to do um, in motion and, and in, in movement uh, with the right people, technology-wise, market-wise, the whole um, view of how this company will move forward. And um, one of the things we, we really stress is don't, don't be afraid to, to talk to other that you can probably see as your competitor. Um, so I, I would urge the industry in general to, 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 to work much, much closer as they do with Nutreco or scripting on the feed side, invite them with you, have partnerships. Uh, Jamie, with his knowledge, um, we see that on, on the waste side, we see it on the processing side, we see it on the genetic, genetic side with benchmark and, and so on. That is where I would like to see the industry be more open, like movie are where they are doing their salmon handbook and giving that out for free every year. That type of confidence, I would like to see that this industry is adapting as fast as possible. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. And obviously offering your time and your knowledge here today is going to be a great contributor to um, the industry progressing together. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank so you. that is coming up to our time here at the RAS Virtual Summit. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, thank you especially to our speakers again for their generosity of knowledge and their time. Um, I think Megan Sorby was the one who mentioned it earlier during this broadcast that we have to continue seeing ourselves as one seafood industry rather than uh, you know, wild fisheries versus farmed aquaculture, especially with this industry's potential to contribute to overall global food production, it is within everyone's interest to be able to progress together. Um, this event came about as a response to a worldwide shutdown in 2020, and we're happy to continue bringing you these great resources virtually. And speaking of, all of us, all of the today's sessions will be, have been recorded and will be available to you via email within the next week. So keep an eye on your inbox inboxes for that. Um, we'd also like to thank our sponsors once again for this virtual for making this virtual event possible. Thank you to our gold sponsor, Merck Animal Health, and thank you also to our silver sponsors, Alumicam, Paniford AX, Oxygard International, and Pro Oceanus. Don't forget that we also have a ton of extra content available for you on our website right now, including a series of presentations on the latest research at the Freshwater Institute. Um, we'll provide a link to you on the chat in case you forgot. Um, but one last thing is if you do have some travel plans for next year, I'd like to invite you to RAS Tech 2023, which is our in-person event, which will take place in Orlando, Florida on April 20th and 21st next year. Um, we are bringing together RAS experts like our speakers today and more from around the world to share ideas and progress the industry together. We have a full schedule of topics that we'll be able to share with you here today and in the next few weeks on our website at ras-tec.com. Um, um, once again, my name is Jean Coden and I am the editor of Hatchery International and RAS Tech Magazine on behalf of our RAS Virtual Summit team and our parent company, Annex Business Media. We hope you enjoyed the day. Thank you for watching. <laughs>